I'm Dana Denha, and you're watching FYI. The flu vaccine is officially available, and we all need to do our part to keep our friends, family, and community safe during this dire health crisis. Learn the facts about flu prevention next. There are many different strains of the flu, but researchers work tirelessly every year on a vaccine to keep the population healthy. The vaccine will protect against four different strains. It's usually around 40 to 60 percent effective across all age ranges. And what that means is that you can still get the flu after getting the flu shot. One easy way to do that is if you're exposed to the flu um, around the same time that you got a flu shot. It takes all vaccines about two weeks to work in the body. Other than being vaccinated, there are some simple tips to keep germs at bay. One of the newer things that little kids are learning is this superhero cough, but it's like taking your cape and going across and <coughs> coughing or sneezing into your arm. <coughs> so washing your hands isn't like putting them under water and then putting, you know, wiping them off on a towel. It's using soap and water and making sure you get all the surfaces and you're supposed to sing like happy birthday. Follow the treatment advice of your, your physician. Take the medication you're supposed to or stay home, hydrate, keep your family safe. Stay tuned and we'll be back with more in exactly 30 seconds. Snakes, spiders, gators, they bring out fear in many of us. But one man is on a mission to teach us more about these species and how to happily cohabitate. The Ann Arbor Hands-On Museum welcomed Dan the Creature Man and his animal friends that make up the Little Creatures Company. When I was in high school, I started working in pet shops and also volunteering at nature centers and realized I really loved these animals and wanted to work with them as long as I could. And now, quite a few years later, I still am, and uh, what I do is run a small outreach program from my home where I take my exotic pets around to schools, libraries, and other places where there are kids pretty much every day and do animal programs for them. For nearly 30 years, Dan has been sharing his exotic pets with the masses. I maintain about 45 species of animals, which I take care of every single day. It's a lot of work, but I enjoy it. Most of what I brought today are the tamer, calmer, and more interesting small animals that I've got, but I tried to bring some that are very touchable, you know, because we're at the Hands-On Museum and it's safe for the kids to touch most of them. We even got up close and personal with a lively lizard. He eats 12 crickets a day, and if you look closely here, he has a tail called a prehensile tail, which they use because of where they live on branches of trees and plants in Madagascar. But it's called a panther chameleon. It's one of the more colorful types of chameleons. I try to just teach people to understand them better and just, you know, if you see a snake in the wild or a tarantula, it's not gonna come running and bite your leg for no reason. If you go after it, that's a different story, but they're not evil creatures. Most wild animals stay away from people, spiders and snakes included. The city is always searching for ways to improve the relationship we have with Mother Earth. It has become clearer over time that the lack of compassion for our planet will have detrimental effects to civilization as we know it. And we're the only ones that can help, either at work or home, to create a world where we all do our part to protect our planet for generations to come. Joining me is Missy Stoltz, Sustainability and Innovations Manager for the City of Ann Arbor. Welcome to the show, Missy. Hey, David, good to see you. Thanks for having me. You know, I was actually thinking about this conversation because, you know, when everything really slowed during the beginning of the pandemic, we saw a really positive impact on the environment. And I think like as time, you know, when I drive around town now and stuff, I see a lot more cars on the road than I was. It's like, it's just a lot more congested. And I, th and I wonder if people are 
conscious of the fact that they're not really, I think the reason why the environment sort of flourished during that time is because we didn't have to go places, but it wasn't a conscious thing we were doing. It was because we had to, but I think it's like important to think about it as a conscious thing that we're doing Mm -hmm. on a daily basis, because when the environment started to have these positive impacts, it made me feel good for my daughter. You know, I'm worried about my daughter and what kind of world we'll live in, you know, when she's a grown up. Totally. Yeah. I think that's really astute. I, I do think it was probably both things. I think it was subconscious um, or it, accidental that we just weren't moving around as much. We saw our vehicle miles traveled by uh, reduced by 50% some weeks during the pandemic, because it's true, right? We weren't going places, or if we were, we were walking and biking to those places. Uh, and really we weren't going to the restaurant. We weren't going to the grocery store as frequently. We were being a little bit more intentional with what we bought, when we bought, how we bought. The other thing though, is this space that you and I are sitting in, we spent more time in this space, right? Mm-hmm. So I converted a closet to be my office during the pandemic. And I was much more aware of its deficiencies, how cold it got or how warm it got. And so I, I think we, what we actually saw perhaps is miles drop, but people paying more attention to where they live and the comfort of their home. And so we did actually see some improvements in residential energy usage during that time that I think were really positive. You know what's something, we both work for the city of Ann Arbor. So this is like one of the things, because I fully work from home still. And this is like one of those things that I completely cut out of my life. And I'm really sort of proud of it. I don't print anything anymore. I never yes. print I don't use paper anymore for work. No paper. <laughs> you know, no. I have a notebook. I'll write some stuff in a notebook. And it's like that notebook will last me months, you know, and it's totally. like one notebook that I have at a time. And I, I used to print out scripts. I used to print out this and I've learned to just work digitally. And I think it's just, it's like, it is um, something you got to get used to because, you know, you got to flip up multiple Fair. screens and stuff and it takes a little bit of time. But once you get there, it's like, why? I hated throwing away. All, I hated recycling so much paper all the time. Isn't it just better to not use it? It's great. I have a rocket book, right? So I, it's reusable. Like mm-hmm. I write, cause I tend to be, I think people function differently. I'm very visual. So when I'm paying attention and I'm very distracted easily, uh, that I have to be like writing notes or just kind of like, I have to be present in this moment. So if you see me jotting, I'm paying attention. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and this is what's nice because then I take a picture of it. I store it and my notes are saved and I just wipe it down. Yeah, I think it's good to talk about these tips because I don't think people, these are the things that people aren't necessarily thinking about. Maybe I would have been printing at home had I had a printer. I didn't have one. So I was like, I have to find a new way to do things and I wasn't going to buy one. So and what, by the way, I don't of, think you can from your printer to your personal. So that's, yeah, I don't think I could have done it anyway. Yeah. I would have to go into the office to print yeah. stuff essentially. Yes. Right. <laughs> so right now, what are some of the hot topics that you're talking about in the office of sustainability? Oh my goodness. There are so many exciting things that are unfolding. One is our kind of renewable energy work in the community. We have this solar discount program that we started, gosh, uh, a year and change ago at this point. And we're over one megawatt, which is a lot of solar that's been generated through that. Residents have saved hundreds of thousands of dollars through that program, that discount program. And it's also summer, right? So it's sunny. We're kind of coming into fall, but people are thinking about it. That's another thing that happened in the pandemic is you were at home and you were thinking about your energy. So we saw like our solar ice program really blossom, which is super exciting. Efficiency, um, that's something we're getting really geeked out about too, because it's about comfort. Uh, Most people don't get really stoked about energy efficiency or water efficiency, but it matters and it creates a more comfortable home, a more affordable home, a safer home. And so we're starting to create programs that really wrap that solar that people want, which is super iconic with efficiency or even electrification work. So next week, we've got a heat pump workshop. If you can't join us live, we'll have some uh, recordings available. We're helping get people ready for beneficial electrification, which is also super good uh, from the standpoint of things like your stove. Many of us have natural gas stoves and a lot of them, if not the vast majority of them aren't properly ventilated, which means every time you turn that on, you have toxic fumes that you're breathing, right? And that's not good for you, your daughter, any of us. And so we're trying to target those kinds of appliances for a switch out to a much cleaner uh, alternative, in this case, electric. So we're working It's on interesting that. that that is like one of those things that I think is actually a sort of a hot topic. A lot of people, I yeah. have an electric stove. That's what we had when we moved into this house. It's capable of being a gas stove, but we would have to install something in our kitchen for yeah, it. Yeah, a connector. Uh, but I think people are going the opposite way. If they have electric, they want gas because they feel like they're, it's not about efficiency. It's about cooking. It's about being able to 
control the temperature a little bit better, I think. But I also think it's one of those things where you just have to get used to your appliances. You know what I mean? You know, yeah. with an electric one, it's going to stay a little bit hotter. So you got to turn it off or turn it on low when you want it to simmer. And electric is so different, right? If you were to go to the market today and look for electric, I mean, electric induction is the way to go. It is way more efficient. Mm -hmm. And I can boil a huge pot of water for pasta in 60 seconds, right? Oh, like yeah. that, that energy is going directly to that pot and you remove that pot. There's nothing to induct it. It is not hot anymore. I mean, it is mm -hmm. such an effective, and I would argue superior cooking experience, but we've been taught right? Like we've been taught that gas is better. So part of our job in OSI is to demystify these kinds of technologies. We're working with some local chefs to cook on these and talk about their experience. And so what does it mean? I mean, if you trust a chef at a local restaurant and suddenly they're cooking on this, you're like, I'm intrigued. I'm intrigued. Okay. This it's still delicious. We're feeling good. We can yeah. I, well, that's the whole thing. I don't think that my food tastes different if I were to cook on a gas stove than an electric. Yeah, the food yeah. tastes the same in the end. You just have to know how to use it. Right. Yeah. That's the, that's the key. Totally. You just have to know how to use your appliances properly. Yep. Yeah. There's so many options out there. So a huge part of our work right now is helping demystify and bring those technologies into kind of commonplace in language. Well, you know, this is something that I, my brother was over here a couple of weeks ago and he had said something to me and I did not like it. And I didn't know how, yeah. how to like, even like explain to him that he was wrong. So I'm going to have you explain it to my audience. He was like, I don't understand this whole energy efficient thing and people go doing this energy efficient thing for their house because there's no savings in the end. This is what he said to me. And so this is like something that I think that is a common misconception about doing it, that you're putting, because you're putting money in initial at the front end. Sure. And I think that some people can't see past that monetary, initial monetary value at the front end, that yeah. eventually they'll, they'll get some savings back. Yeah. So it depends on what you do, but the vast majority of efficiency things that we're talking about uh, are going to have an ROI or return on an investment for you. So things like putting insulation into your home, air sealing, or uh, sealing your windows. I think what most people don't know is the average home is giving anywhere between 30 and like really bad homes, you know, upwards, like closer to 50% of the energy that you use, you are just handing to the outdoors, right? It's just flowing. So if you think about it from that perspective, you're basically saying 40% of my energy bill, I'm just throwing away. Yeah, because totally. it's not helping warm me or the people in my home, or it's not cooling me. It's not working for me. That's what efficiency is. It's saying let's let's stop that, right? Like let's make sure that what you use, you actually use. Now, depending on how leaky your home is, you could have return on investments that are really really fast. Replacing light bulbs, super fast. You know, return on investment depending on what you have and what you switch to. You could have less than a year, and every year thereafter, you save money on that asset, right? Mm -hmm. So that's a win win. If you need to do insulation in your attic, you might, depends on what you're doing and how much you need, but you might be at a five year, you might be at an eight year return on investment. The trickier stuff tend to be things like windows. Um, windows windows are really expensive and they yes, do they tend That's not to be things that have good return on investment. The problem, I guess the window situation, I, the way I would put a window, honestly, um, if you need windows, then get mm -hmm. them and then they yeah. will help improve. I mean, you'll eventually everyone mm -hmm. needs to buy windows. That's just like, if you're going to stay exactly. in a house, you'll eventually need to buy. I mean, I actually, when we bought the house I live in now, it had all new windows except one. And it's a huge window. It's a 10 by 10 uh -huh. foot window in the front mm -hmm. of the house. And so we've lived here for like nine years and I'm like, I hate this window. It's so cold all the time. I'm yeah, always it's drafty, cold. right? Of course. Yeah, super drafty. So I was like, that's it we're spending the money and I'm replacing this window. This, we just did it like a month or two ago. And it's a huge difference. The house is colder in the air conditioning. It's warmer when the heat, I can already tell it's a huge See, You difference. just named it. I mean, yeah. so this is the thing, like we can, we can focus on one variable. We can focus on dollars and cents, or we can start adding in the full, uh, the full round out of vari variables that are influenced, right? The so experience, you your life experience. Yeah, comfort right in your home, you don't want to have to like go into that room and be like, oh, I can't sit next to this beautiful window because it's too drafty or I have to wear a blanket every time I sit, mm -hmm. right? Like there's comfort. And then there are things like light, right? More efficient windows. You can have better light experience. I don't have lights on in my home right now because I don't need them on because the window is lighting us. Like there's just other benefits that come health benefits, happiness benefits. It makes a lot of sense. Maybe not always dollars and cents sense, but when you factor in all of those variables, it's a logical investment. 
Well, you know, recently the city of Ann Arbor has sort of adopted this hybrid working situation. Do you think that's mm -hmm. beneficial as a whole to the city for sustainability goals? I do. Yeah, I, I'm a proponent of teleworking where we can. I do want to acknowledge that it's in many industries, it's not even right who can telework and who can't telework and we need to be honest and kind of address that openly for uh, many of us that are kind of more traditional office workers that is absolutely a viable a, a viable tool in our toolkit so my team is almost 100% virtual we do a lot of public events and what's super great about that too is i don't have to go to city hall and then go over here and then come back to city hall and go over here i'm actually reducing vmt because i'm in the community i walk or bike to my community events now. And it's just a different sort of experience. And it's allowing me to connect with members of the public I think, much more intimately than I have before. So I'm pretty jazzed about teleworking. How are you? Do you like it? Oh my, I, first of all, I love it so much. I, I know at some point I'm going to have to like partially be back in the office, obviously. Yeah. There's no question because we have to do studio stuff, but I love the comfort of being in my home. Like, I just think mm -hmm. it's really special to be able to work in your house. I really yeah. do. I so I it. think there's yeah. something really great about it. And I think I'm so glad, you know, I used to do it a little bit after I had my daughter, I do it like so many hours a week or whatever, a very small period amount of time. But after this happened, I was like, it's pretty evident that we all can do a lot more work at home than we were even like sort of being allowed to do, you know, in the past. So yeah, yeah. if we you let that we people could. do it, I think they can really prove. And in some ways I feel like I'm more efficient at home, okay. you know? It was a natural experiment that I don't know that the city really thought that it was ready for, but we proved that we could. And so now on the other side of it, it would be a shame not to recognize what we learned, you know, goods and bads in that and integrate it into this process. Also, one of the projects we're looking to take on right now is to encourage more of our businesses to keep teleworking because that reduction in VMT was really, really significant both for our planet, but also for our health as well and our happiness by having that flexibility you just talked about. Yeah. So we're hoping to launch a project uh, with a student group at the university where we identify our major employers and who has uh, the most employees commuting in and who has the best option for telework. So we can try to keep those numbers pretty low. Well, and I think it's been pretty obvious over this time frame that people want to telework. This is like mm -hmm. people are looking for jobs Many. where they can telework now. So you're going to get a higher quality candidate if you're giving them an option where they can work from home. Totally. Yeah. I, yeah. And you, I think the social interaction is important. And I know you didn't ask this, but one of the things that our team also does in OSI is we do have monthly team building activities. Like we adopted a park together and the public can join us anytime they want. So we adopted Bandamere and we come together as a team and we clean up Bandamere and we interact. And then we do have public facing events where we're together. Last night we had um, our ambassadors, our A2 is zero ambassadors, second cohort kicked off with a meet and greet. So a lot of the team was there. And so we're still seeing each other just in different ways and uh, organic like our offices you can come in anytime you want to and do team building like that's still space that you mm -hmm. have for creative creative work um, but you don't have to you can do your work where you can do your work I also like that you mentioned that you bike a lot now because I started biking more too I got a bike and I was and now I try to think of like things I can do where I don't have to drive my car I like don't sure. want to take my car anymore if I don't have to so I was like hey, hey, you know, uh, CTN, I never, I never drive to CTN anymore. I always ride my bike to CTN. That's awesome. So like, I do have to go in occasionally. It's usually in, at night and I'll do like a voiceover or something and I'll take my daughter and we'll ride our bikes. It'll be like a bike ride. It's so That's fun. Great. Like you never would have been able to do this stuff. Had you worked a traditional 40 hour a week job. And honestly, I don't know if I would have rode my bike to work if I were working a uh, eight hour day, yeah. because if I had to be on camera, I wouldn't want to be like sweaty or anything like that. Sure. Do you know what I mean? Like it takes totally. like working eight hours a day takes back. There's other factors that go into it as well. Yeah. Now. Family time. Like you want to get home as quick as possible. Or you have to pick family. your kid up from yeah. school, anything. Exactly. Yeah. So having that flexibility is nice. Also, you're a professional and I trust you to make good choices. Right. <laughs> so like I, I sort of feel that way too. I don't need to micromanage my team. Like we'll address issues that emerge, but you know, I, we've talked about electric vehicles in the past. And I think like, I actually saw, I was watching live with Kelly and Mike or Ryan. Now it's Ryan Seacrest now. And they had this, I've never seen anything like this. It was a big truck that was an electric vehicle in the front was the trunk. Yeah. And it was yeah crazy. Sure. I'm like, this is amazing. I could not believe the how far technology has come in the realm of electric vehicles. 
It's amazing. And, and yeah. I know like when you're buying them, you're spending a little bit extra money on the front end, but I know that those savings have to come pretty quickly when you're not like filling up gas and stuff. Yeah. You're not paying for gas and maintenance. You don't have as many moving parts that are going to break. And we're actually finding that to be true as we've been bringing more electrics into the city's fleet. Uh, they're, they're performing, they're working well. So we still have some really ambitious goals and we're trying to work on helping our community transition to electric vehicles. This would be one of the downsides, if you will, of the pandemic is supply chain disruption. So we just don't have as many vehicles on the lots as what we had hoped we would have pre-pandemic, but it's coming. I mean, we see projections of more and more types of electric vehicles. And at some point they're going to hit cost parity, you know, at, at upfront cost with an internal combustion engine. We're pretty stoked. We actually have, I don't know if folks know, but we have on order our first electric refuse truck. So our first really? all electric recycling truck is going to come. That's so, I mean, station. when you think about really big vehicles like that, it almost seems impossible. It's so cool that we're at that That's point so now, cool. because when we first started seeing like hybrid vehicles, they were like these really tiny, tiny cars. Mm -hmm. And now we're like, it's like real, it's actually happening. And I, it makes me excited that, you know, the next time I need to buy a car, we need to buy a family car that we should really be looking into these electric options and how great they are. Yeah, it's a huge part of what we're thinking about is, and, and not just thinking about working on, is building the infrastructure so that people can charge their vehicles at work while out recreating, while at home, and also have access to these various technologies and, and make people comfortable with them. I'm pretty excited. We have a car that is like with us and we're going to keep it because that's the most sustainable thing. Like keep what you got. Yeah. But when it goes, like we are, we're, I'm pretty excited for electric. Yeah, it's great. Well, yeah, I actually said to my husband recently, I go, you know, we don't even need two cars. Like we don't need two cars anymore. He has a car that he has. that's like a fun car that's fast that I can't even drive it because I don't know how to drive a stick shift. And totally. I was like, if, if you didn't have, we could just literally live off of my car. Like it, if we had sure. one car, we could both drive. We don't need two cars anymore. But We're I think we car. put, we put so little miles. Like nowadays, I'm barely ever driving my car. My car is like a brand new car just oh, yeah. in my garage. Legit, we're one car. So yeah. we've been one car since we've been in Ann Arbor. And what we're thinking about doing, ooh, uh, trading in one of my bikes, I have two bikes, full disclosure, uh, trading in one of them and getting an electric cargo bike. So that, that's got like the bucket in front so that I can take my daughter to and from school and the YMCA and other places. Oh yeah. Because I don't know about you, she bikes, which is great and fun, but she, we get her to school and then she takes the bus to the YMCA but then her bike is still here. So it, oh, makes, yeah, yeah, right. Like in the gates, the trip. So we were thinking about doing that. And then I don't know how often we'll use the car if we have a cargo bike. Cause you can take that thing to the grocery store and load up, you go to Costco. Like oh, it yeah. is basically like, it's your storage. Pretty exciting. Well, I will tell you for someone that loved riding a bike when I was younger and then started doing it again, it just makes you feel good. It's not even about like being good to the environment. It's about that, obviously, but it makes you feel good. You're like, I rode my bike today. I did it. Yeah. I got on it. I did some exercise, you know, you outside. Makes, yes. Like, it ah. makes you feel good. Is there anything else you want to talk about? I know you mentioned quickly mentioned water. I know when we you replace toilets nowadays, it's really hard not to get one that's low flow, which I think is fantastic. Like I know totally. people complain about it because they're a little dirtier. Like they have a tendency not to like clean the bowl as well. Just keep your toilet brush next to it and wipe there it. There you go. There you go. You know, I think as we're talking more, and I, I recognize we're talking about kind of individual behavior, I would say a, a few kind of high level things. What are, don't forget those reusable bags when you go to the store, right? Plastic is a really serious issue. That we have a reusable container, um, a returnable container pilot right now with four restaurants. And we're looking to expand that where if you order from them and get to go or you take anything with you, it's in a reusable con and returnable container. Nice. So yeah. That's pretty, that's pretty great. And thinking about how we, how we really strive to eliminate single use plastics um, is, is an important kind of element of this work. We've got some efforts underway around the circular economy. So basically when I'm done with this pen, this pen still has useful life. Its materials are still valuable, just not to me as a pen. So how do we make sure that we can break this down into something that's useful? So constantly kind of thinking about what you use, how you can repurpose it, and when you can't, how we can put it back into use in an alternative way. And right now, you're kind of limited in choices. There's some great things like a, a zero-waste Facebook group that you can be a part of, and you can do some exchanges. There's the reuse center, and of course, you can recycle things. But that's, that's an area of work where we're trying to create more and more markets for repurposing. And then I think the last I want to kind of point out to folks is the power of the purse. 
broadly speaking, which is one of the things that a lot of us don't think about is our retirement and what our retirement is investing in, right? It's investing in us and mm -hmm. our future, mm -hmm. but it's also investing in businesses today. And are those bus businesses that are helping preserve our planet or are those businesses we're extracting from it? And so having a conversation with whoever manages your retirement portfolio, whether that's the city, whether that is a private firm, whether that is a nonprofit, whoever it is, and asking what they have. What are they doing? What investment portfolios do you have to make sure your dollars work for you and for the planet? Uh, that's, that's just a, you know, that's, that's a really great way to think. But I actually don't think I've ever would have even thought of it that way, honestly, that sure. if yeah, I were putting money not. into, you know, I do try to be considerate and like not shop Amazon and stuff. You know what I mean? Because sure you try to do your little part that you can, uh, it, talking on a bigger scope, did you want to mention anything that maybe businesses in the area? I know you sort of mentioned, uh, businesses are a big deal because they, big they deal. make a lot of pollution, <laughs> you know, they, they can. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> well, things that we can do, I, I think from a business perspective, but also as kind of an individual within this landscape, anything that we do that is local has cascading impacts, um, in, in the positive. That's dollars that are more likely to stay in the local economy because those people employ local people and they're investing back in our local system. Um, if you can buy food that's more local, that's less miles traveled. And again, um, chances are there are better living wages that you're paying folks uh, for the food that they're actually producing. For our business community, anyone who might be listening, we have uh, various initiatives. We're working on some energy work with the 2030 district to help you lower your footprint in your buildings themselves mm -hmm. and your water consumption so that you have lower bills, but also you and your uh, your employees have safer environments in which to be working and your consumers are in a safer, healthier environment as well. We're doing a project uh, right now with the 2030 district and you can join that district and, and be a part of that with us. We're working on some energy disclosure uh, work so that we can understand where we have really high performers in the commercial space and where we have folks who have opportunity for growth so we can start pairing them to do sharing of lessons learned. And then uh, hopefully it'll be a few months, but hopefully in the not too distant future, we're going to launch our green business challenge, which gives an opportunity for businesses to be recognized for the really cool and innovative things that they're doing. And yeah, you, I just remembered, you know, but, so sorry, before I go, we have a grant program it's called Sustaining Ann Arbor Together. It's a $10,000 grant program that uh, residents can apply for to do anything related to sustainability in the public. So we have a lot of projects. We have 44 projects in A20. Uh, we're actively working on 34 of those projects right now in this moment. So we're doing a lot of things, but those aren't the universe of things. I bet you have really good ideas. And so apply for the grant funding and help us. Well, that's it. Yeah. So, and you guys are looking, I, it sounds like you need volunteers too, because you're busy. So always you need volunteers always. yeah so we go do. on the we website to find out all this information right that's right at a20 you can go to a20.org actually which will redirect you to the city site or you can go to a2gov.org slash sustainability yeah and i think like i said it's one of those things that once you actually get out there and do this stuff it really makes you feel good and like it's better than just sitting back and being like sad that the environment of the environmental state and like get out there and get your hands dirty and be a part of it honestly Absolutely. And validating. I just want to say for the, the people who hear that and are feeling despair, that is real. And that is an okay thing to feel. And it's demonstrative of the moment in time that we're in. I like to kind of ground myself in the saying that I think fundamentally you, Dan and I are of the generation that we're lucky enough to be the first that really understand the full magnitude of the impacts of climate change. And we're also the last to do something about it. Yeah. You can take that as a sad thing. Or you can take that as a call to action. And I take it as a call to action. I so agree. Let's get to I, it. Yeah. Like, like you said, we both have daughters. We want, I want my daughter to be able to have her own daughter someday. Yeah. You know, precisely. And have clean air and clean water in the process. Yeah. I want them to yes. know that polar bears exist in the wild. Yes, yes. exactly. Yes. yes. Well, thank you so much, Missy, for coming on the show again. My pleasure. So great. Thanks for the time. For more on this and other programs, visit a2gov.org slash ctn. Visit youtube.com slash ctn and arbor to see all that we have to offer. And remember to like, subscribe, and ring that notification. Thanks for watching and tune in next time to FYI. Mm -hmm.